Building muscle is hard as all get out. So the last thing you wanna do is give some of that hard earned goodness back when you're in a deficit by doing things that are easily avoided. Dropping body fat while keeping muscle is the key to achieving the look you want. So today, let's talk about how we can keep as much of that hard earned muscle as possible on episode 265 of The Drop Set. Let's hit it. Hey everybody, and thank you for joining me. This is episode 265 of The Drop Set. To all those out there watching in YouTube land, hello, thank you, and for those listening to the audio-only version. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? I've been talking to them for a while already. So uh, if you want to hear the behind the scenes of that, you can go listen to it on a uh, podcast platform of your choice. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, CastBox, Stitcher. There's a whole bunch of others. I don't know what they all are. I have a service that uploads it to them, to, to all of those automatically for me. So they're on there though, absolutely. So you can check it out there. You can watch here either way. Thank you for joining me and making me a part of your day. So we're going to talk today about avoiding muscle loss in a deficit. Um, as soon as I rewind for a second and remind you guys where you can find me online, you can find me on Instagram at Darren underscore star or the show itself at the drop set podcast. And of course, you can also hear about everything, hear about, read about, Good God. Um, at fivestarphysique.com and also fivestardigital.com, which is where I have my online courses housed. So um, avoiding muscle loss in a deficit. This is episode 265. So let's get into it here real quick. Like a few things just as kind of like primer information here. So what are the expectations of this? Like, should you lose muscle in a deficit? Is that the expectation? Um, and I would say, yes, absolutely. It's worth knowing that all of this stuff is just based on visuals and estimations. Like if you get DEXA scans done, in, in body, bod pod, whatever, none of those things are accurate. Not enough to make any meaningful determinations from. I know everybody says a DEXA scan, it's like so accurate. It's not, it's not. I've seen so many blatantly, obviously wrong DEXA scans in my life. I just know that I can't trust them. They might give you a general idea of what direction things are going in, but if it says you lost 0.3 pounds of muscle, that's like so far within the margin of error. It's like, it tells you nothing. It tells you absolutely nothing. So we, we can't really look to that as being any kind of meaningful guide or anything. So should you expect to lose muscle? And the, the truth is for a natural athlete, yeah. Yeah, you should. You're probably going to lose some. Not definitely, but probably. I would expect it. I would go into that just knowing that it's going to be non-zero, but we want to minimize it. We want to make it as little of a loss as possible. Um, when maybe should you not expect to? Um, well, I mean, if you're, if you're running a cycle, that would be a contributing factor for sure. That's going to make it easier to approach that, uh, that zero point of muscle loss. If you're brand new to lifting and you're just coming in at a deficit, like you're actually probably going to build muscle for a little bit, depending on how long you stay in that deficit. It might not be for too long, but for some stretch of it, absolutely. You can actually grow and then maintain, and then you can worry about losing stuff a little bit further down the road. Um, that, that would be kind of an outlier of a circumstance for sure. Um, can you gain muscle in a deficit? Again, if you are very new to lifting. If you're running a super aggressive cycle, it's possible. But again, if you're in a big enough deficit, law of thermodynamics states there just isn't enough energy there to create new tissue or to grow it. So the answer is realistically, no, I certainly wouldn't expect to. Um, you'd also have to be a bit of a genetic outlier in order for that to be the case. So e experience does matter, but not in the way that you might think. So if you're actually less experienced, but you come into this and have a really short learning curve, like everything just starts to make sense. You don't have a lot of lifting experience, but you just come in and just matrix style, you get an upload and you know Kung Fu all of a sudden, and you can go and attack your workouts aggressively from the start. Even at a deficit, you'll build muscle early on in that process, and then you'll have a, light, a higher likelihood of retaining it, um, even on a deficit, just because your training age is very low. Um, the higher your training age, the more likely you are to fall into the more expected pattern, meaning if you're on a deficit, your muscle loss, you're going to have a greater risk of it just because uh, it, you're, you're not going to be, you know, you you really need to rely on that lack of training age in order to be able to build muscle. You're not gonna have that. Therefore, the only thing you can really do is lose it or hope to retain it. And so therefore, it's gonna rely on your experience and your training intensity and your ability to control these other factors that we'll talk about here um, that are gonna make it more likely that you'll be able to keep that muscle loss as close to zero as possible. 
So why do we care about this? I mean, it, it should be fairly obvious, but let's just state the obvious here just so that it's part of the official record. Building muscle is hard as shit. And dropping body fat is difficult, but it's not as hard. And the point of a cut is to drop body fat and show the muscle that you busted your ass to build. That's the whole idea behind it. So, and that's true whether you're trying to get up on stage or not. Like whether you're trying to show that muscle on stage, oiled up and tan in posing trunks, or you're just look, looking to walk around the beach or just walk around town wearing something comfortable and looking sharp, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but muscle retention while dropping body fat. That's the secret sauce. That's the spot where you want to be. Anybody can be a dumbass and just starve themselves and do hours of cardio and just let their body just eat away at whatever lean tissue they've built up and be lean, but not really look terribly impressive. And the impressive is what we're going for. And retaining muscle at a deficit is where the impressive comes from. So there are, of course, a lot of contributing factors here. It's never, you know, there's never just one answer. We can't just have it be simple like that. It would be great if that were the case. But unfortunately, this is real life on planet Earth and nothing is ever simple. So um, now as we go through this list, one of these might be the biggest issue that you're facing. But you want to look at everything and just see if there are other boxes that you need to check and other small things that you could do to reduce your risk of losing tissue on a deficit here and just make whatever changes you have to make. Um, you know, we, you can look through this and if we get to the first one here, which is going to be like, oh, I'm definitely under eating. That's it. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, maybe you're doing other things too. Maybe, maybe you're leaving multiple doors open for this path and we can start shutting uh, as many of those as we possibly can. So yes, yeah, spoiler alert. The first one of these is under eating is the first thing that you could be doing that's contributing to muscle loss. So, um, now, we need to be in a deficit in order to drop body fat. That's how science works. That's how the law of thermodynamics works. Uh, but we always want, my, I maintain, you always want the smallest deficit that you can possibly achieve while still getting the rate of loss that we're after. So if you drop too fast, that means, you know, if you're dropping four pounds per week, there's probably some lean tissue loss that's going in there as well. Now, it's not necessarily one pound of that, but, you know, if it's a quarter pound and you sustain that for a month, now you've lost a pound of, of, of lean tissue. Think about how long it takes to build that pound. Like, that's hard. That's hard. It's way easier to lose it just by being a little overly aggressive and reckless with how you diet than it is to gain it. It's, it's much easier to lose than it is to build. Um, so, and if you've got other variables that are, that we'll talk about here, um, later on that are uh, also uh, contributing factors here, it's going to make it more difficult as well. So what you want to do here is work backwards from where you start thinking about where you want to end up and do the math and then give that a quick gut check here. Typically, if you're dropping one to one and a half percent of your body weight per week, you're probably in a reasonably good territory. I would not get much more aggressive than that. So if you are 200 pounds, you could drop two, maybe upwards of three pounds per week and be in pretty good shape um, as far as minimizing the likelihood that you're going to be losing any significant lean tissue. Again, it's probably not going to be zero, but it will probably be very minimal. So... Um, but uh, figure out, and experience kind of helps with this. So experience can hurt as far as just making it more physiologically likely that you're going to lose muscle, especially if your training intensity is a little bit lower. Uh, but it can help you here in the experience going through these cycles, these growth cut cycles, and figuring out what body weight you start at, what body weight you end up at, how long did it take, what was your rate of loss, how did you look when you got down to, let's say you started at 220 pounds, you cut down to 190, how do you look at 190? Was that lean enough? Did you need to really drop another 8 pounds? Should you have been at 182 instead? Dead, something like that. You go through this process enough, you go through enough of these cycles, you can make those intelligent decisions and say like, man, I started at 220 was too soft. I had to work way too hard to get down to 190 and that still wasn't lean enough. I need to get down to 182. So I shouldn't really get any heavier than 210 or 205 or something like that. So you can make those decisions and then game out what your rate of loss should be for per week. Say two pounds per week is about where I want to be. I would say for someone in that body weight, that's a sweet spot. If you're somewhere around, you know, female around 140, 150, if you're dropping one to one and a half pounds per week, that's a good sweet spot to be in. Um, and then just multiply that out and figure out, you know, here's where I am. Here's the number kind of where I want to end up. Just do the math and figure out this is how many weeks I need. And then give yourself a little bit of extra time in there as a buffer. So um, you can 
set yourself up for greater success just by being a little bit more finicky about the time that you give yourself on the front end before you even start the process. Um, the next thing would be too much output. So we're under eating. What if we're just overworking? So this can mean cardio or training, but I want to start with the cardio side of things first. Um, hit, I would say generally for fat loss in a deficit is a bad idea. Um, and lower intensity cardio is going to give you greater area under the curve. So this is a, uh, this comes from integral calculus. Don't worry. There's no homework assignment that comes attached to this, but if you were to draw a graph on screen, maybe if I am really, really ambitious in my post-production editing here, I will put a, a graph on screen and kind of start to shade some areas here. So you can see, you know, if you were to graph your cardio and say like, here's your duration on the X axis and here's your calories per minute burned on the Y axis here, you can, graph that over time and you can shade the area under that graph that's your area under the curve so if you do a longer session even with a lower per minute burn rate just figuring out what the human body is typically capable of doing um, uh, how much your performance diminishes over time if you're doing high intensity cardio where your permanent burn rate is going to be higher but your performance is going to drop off a cliff much faster and you're not going to be able to sustain to sustain that session for as long you will burn more calories in total with lower intensity cardio and it's less fatiguing it doesn't create it doesn't carry as much fatigue cost associated with it if you do hit cardio and you do a, a weight training session on the same day that's a lot for your body to recover from if you do a weight training session and some lower intensity cardio that's still a lot for your body to recover from but it's less and you burn more calories net from doing that so you're solving one problem while not creating a second problem so steady state cardio just tends to for most people make more sense um, steps are a great addition here as well you can still overdo it with a ton of low intensity cardio and a super high step count if you push those really high like if you're doing 90 minutes of cardio a day and you're pushing 30,000 steps a day like yeah you can still overdo it even if you're not working super hard but you have to try it, it's harder uh, in doing that now of course you can also combine the previous two you can overwork and under eat and that creates a pretty significant problem as well so either one of those on its own is a, a bit of an issue but if you put both of them together ugh, you know if it's just one of them you can probably overcome that you know if you're under eating but you're doing a very very moderate amount of cardio for example and i would usually um I, when i'm working with clients i will ask them I'm like you know do you want to eat less and be a little bit hungrier but do more cardio wait, or do less cardio, or do you want to eat a little bit more, but do more cardio? So be more satiated. Like, you know, I talked many times um, over the course of my prep, my strategy was to do a little bit more cardio, but eat more as well. And I feel like that worked well for me. Some people who are maybe not super food motivated, who are very non-dog-like <laughs> might be okay with eating less, um, which means doing less cardio, uh, cardio as well. So um, that's certainly a possibility. Um, so having to contend with both of those, like overworking and under eating, um, it's a much bigger problem. And it's also pretty common because bodybuilding attracts people who think that the more work that you do, the better. And that's one of the things I'm always trying to correct in clients that I work with, which is, yeah, you need to work hard, but reasonably so. Like there are limits to what you can expect your body to recover from and what you can put your body through and still have it cooperate with you in terms of fat loss at an appropriate rate. Poor sleep is the next one here. So poor sleep leads to poor performance in all areas of your life. So that's going to be training, um, uh, your job, probably your relationship will suffer a little bit. And I would also say, uh, it, when you're, when you're under rested, when you're having poor sleep, you tend to make decisions more like a drunk person does. Like you're just not really in your clear head nearly as much. So it, it's a big problem it can lead to issues with following your diet correctly, just because you know, you're, you're doing that low sleep drunk type thinking and making dumb decisions related to food as well. So, um, when we're talking about things like physical things, like training, the downsides of it are going to be way more obvious. Like it's going to be very easy. You can very easily correlate. Oh, I didn't sleep very well. God, why is the weight so heavy today? It's because you didn't sleep well. Like it's a direct one-to-one -one cause and effect relation. That's very easy to spot out. Um, naps super helpful but they are a band-aid if you're not getting that longer uninterrupted sleep that's at a high quality at night that's what you really need so by all means put a band-aid on if you need to but don't think of that as being the thing that's really going to solve the issue just set aside more time for sleep you know, take any kind of supplement that you need to whether that's an antihistamine whether it's melatonin or whatever anything that's
that's going to help knock you out and improve that quality of sleep. Over-the-counter stuff tends to work very well for a lot of people. Magnesium is another thing as well. Excess stress, or if you have reasonable stress, but you do a terrible job managing it, this is another thing that's going to lead to a greater likelihood of muscle loss because your stress hormone is cortisol, and it is you know, probably the most catabolic hormone in the human body. So um, it, is, it is sitting there like a sleeping beast ready to eat muscle if you wake it up. So don't let it wake up. Now, we can't be stress-free. As I often like to say, we are living in the year of our Lord, 2024, and we are, many of us, citizens of the United States of America. It's also an election year. It's going to be stressful, okay? There is stress. You just can't avoid it. You know, the economy of the world being in the situation is like, there's stress, okay? But there's a normal amount of stress that we can expect and learn how to deal with and learn how to cope with. And then there's... Um, there are things that are outside of that, you know, things that happen in your life, events that come up, whether they be personal, relationship, family, job, neighbors, whatever, you know, things come up and you just have to deal with those and you have to manage those. And my approach for those is always very simple and it's incredibly obvious, which is tackle those head on. Now, if you're stressed out because your neighbor's an asshole and they've called the HOA on you because your garage door is painted the wrong color or something like that, how does eating a, a package of donuts help with that? Like the stress eating is a real thing that people rely on. It's not really like, I always think of that as being more of an excuse than anything else. And really what, what's happening here is you wanted the donuts and now you have some stress thing and you're using that to rationalize a bad decision, which, okay, that's fair. Just recognize it for what it is. It's not stress eating. It's just, I'm rationalizing this decision by blaming it on stress. But, it doesn't solve the issue. So what you need to do is have a conversation with your neighbor, talk to the HOA people, whatever, I mean, you know, just handle the issue. And if that means you have to repaint your garage door because it's in clear violation of the HOA, well, paint your fucking garage door, you know, just solve the issue, but don't let this stuff just go on uh, unresolved for a long period of time. There's a situation at work. Oh, my boss is stressing me out. My coworker is stressing me out, whatever. Have the difficult conversation, do it, deal with it, put it to bed as best you can, or at least diffuse the situation, do your part of it. And sometimes there are things that come up where it's like, there's nothing I can do about this. Cool. So work on allowing your brain to just flush that out of it um, when it's not necessary. There may be times when it's like, oh, I need to worry about this now. I need to think about this. There's a decision that has to be made on this. And other times it's like, man, I'm really worried about global warming. What, what can I do about global warming? Well, you know what? That goes outside the scope of what we can talk about on this podcast, but there might be some things that you can do, but one of the biggest things that you can do is not worry about it and not let it impact your prep. <laughs> so there's a time to worry about it and there's a time to not worry about it. Um, I would also say that being busy and being stressed are very different things. If you're managing your time well, you can be exceptionally busy and I'm not going to say stress-free, but pretty low stress. Um, it's when you're super busy and you don't manage it well that it becomes really chaotic and starts to take over your life and become unmanageable. So here, here's the big one here. And this is overtraining and under recovering. So we're going to tackle a couple, um, a couple branches of this here. So um, now this overtraining can mean too many training days in a week. It means can mean too many training days in a row, can mean too much volume on a single day or all of the above or a combination of those things. Um, what I want you to do, though, is track your workouts using progressive overload. And keep in mind that when you're in a deficit, seeing legit progress on progressive overload is going to be a challenge just because you don't have the extra, you know, actual gas or fuel in the tank to facilitate that improved performance week after week. But you want to be able to maintain a, a reasonably high level of performance and feel good about the work that you put in. If you're consistently walking out of the gym saying, well, that sucked. Ugh, that was a waste of time. It's like, yeah, you're probably overtrained. You probably need a break in some way. And it could also be that some of these other factors are contributing to it. So we're going to go over um, at the end of this an order of operations for how to handle all this. But just be mindful of what it feels like to be overtrained. Um, so what you can do, like I would recommend if you're in a position where you're feeling like this, just a few things that you can do off the cuff. Scale down your training volume to the lower side of what we would consider to be like minimal um, uh, minimum uh uh, effective volume. Uh, so like eight to 12 sets per body part per week, 
would be good there, which might mean, oh man, so for chest, I'm just going to do two exercises, four sets each. Yeah, that's fine. You know, make sure they're good sets, but that, that's fine. Move on. Take an extra day off. This is one thing that people are loath to do, but it really does nothing negative. Um, it interrupts your schedule a little bit, but guess what? If you're feeling like this, your schedule needs interruption. So don't hesitate to pull the trigger on that. You can also modulate your rest days a little bit longer term. So if you're following like a three on one off protocol, you could switch that to two on one off, one on one off. So you're still hitting five, uh, three workouts over five days instead of three workouts over four days. Eh, nothing wrong with that. That's great. It just stretches things out a little bit, gets that extra day off worked in there. Um, and also listen to your body, which is really dumb, vague advice. Um, I do have a chapter in Hypertrophy University where I talk about exactly what it means to be and feel recovered. That chapter is 40 minutes long. So it's I actually had to split it into, into two parts, but it gets very in-depth. And so I would say be aware of the conversation that your body is trying to have with you. So listen to your body. It's the same thing said differently, but just try to interpret the signals. And part of it is knowing what to pay attention for. Um, are you still excited to go train? Are you eager to get to the gym? Do you feel good about the quality of work that you're putting in? Um, that kind of stuff. Other things to watch for, you know, watch for these signs. So the first one being poor performance in the gym, like we talked about, that's the most critical thing. If somebody is going to say, come to and ask me, Darren, I, how do I know if I'm losing muscle on a cut? The first thing I would ask is, well, how's your training performance? If it's not great, the answer is you're probably losing some and probably more than you want to. Because again, it's pretty much always non-zero. Um, but we, we want it to be as close to zero as possible. If your training performance is garbage, you're going to be a little further away from that zero mark than you probably want to be. So that's the first key thing. Um, general uh, level of like, you know, whenever anything happens and it feels like the end of the world, um, that's a good sign that you might be in a little bit of a uh, uh, fatigue hole, <laughs> uh, mood shifts, irritability, that kind of stuff. So uh, how do we fix it? What do we do about this? So all of these things I would say are in, in different columns. So you've got like your under eating column, your overworking column. Within that, we have sub columns for cardio and for training. We have sleep, stress. Figure out which of those columns seem to be the most problematic for you. After listening to this, you'll have a good idea. Like you you have some, some of these things where you're like nodding your head and like, yes, that's me. And other things where you're like, no, I'm good there. And you can you know kind of self-evaluate and honestly say like, yeah, I feel pretty good about that in my relationship with that particular column. So so um, the first, and just figure out which of those you're having the most trouble in, which one of those columns you're having the hardest time keeping up with. I would self-assess self -assess regarding sleep and stress, knowing that those are the two things like uh, I would consider those kind of like the master levers that kind of control everything else. Like you might be totally fine in the gym, eager to train, et cetera. But if your sleep is off and your stress is high, your performance in the gym might still suck. You might not be overtrained at all, uh, but those things can interfere with it. And so you'd want to fix those first. So as far as order of operations are concerned, I would tackle those first. Just assess your mood, your willingness to train, your performance in the gym, and just look at your overall intake and output. Like if you look at your intake numbers, and if you're a guy and you're clocking in at like 190, 200 pounds and you're eating 1400 calories a day, like that ain't enough. <laughs> so you're under eating at that point. And yes, muscle loss is happening for sure. So again, our order of operations, poor sleep, fix that first. That is really kind of like the master key switch for everything else. And I would put stress as a 1B to sleep's 1A. Um, and again, we're not looking to be stress-free. You just want to manage it. Um, take a day off or three if you need to, um, but maintain your macros, maintain your steps, maintain your cardio. So again, steps and cardio being the things that are not going to fatigue you nearly as much. We're still going to feed you appropriately. The training, um, resistance training is the stuff that really drives more fatigue. If we remove that, how do we feel then? And then you can also consider a refeed if necessary. I would say in terms of preventing muscle loss and trying to combat fatigue, a refeed is, you know, it's usually people's first thing that they want to reach for just because you're under eating, you're hungry, you want to eat. You're like, I think I need a refeed. It's usually the thing that's going to actually help you the least. So I would, I would pull the trigger on that after everything else, only if it seems necessary at that point. So as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I have to say about that. So um, 
I thank you all for hanging out with me here today. This has been episode 265. Once again, you can find me online at all the places where I am. That's fivestarphysique.com, fivestardigital.com, uh, on Instagram at Darren underscore star, and also the show at The Drop Set Podcast on Instagram. Also, I am kind of trying to do a little bit of stuff on TikTok, and I think I am at Darren underscore star there as well. I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me on that. I'll uh, throw it up on screen for YouTube viewers after I've had a chance to check that out. So anyway, thank you all for watching. Appreciate it. Um, hit me up on socials if you have questions, and I'll catch you all next week. Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. FiveStarPhysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.